good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Oakers. Our uh, welcome and call to worship this morning is going to come from Psalm 66. Uh, Psalm 66 will begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read on down through verse 7. Uh, so Psalm 66, verse 1, and we'll read on down through verse 7. And as you're turning there, just a, a couple of announcements. Uh, one is that uh, we have our uh, membership meeting uh, after service. It'll be a quick update. And uh, don't forget that if you are a member here, you need to have your uh, search committee ballots turned in today. Um, and so uh, that is going to be, you know, there's two ways you can turn it in today. One, you put it in the offering box or you can put it in the offering plate as it's being passed uh, during service today. So uh, make sure you have those turned in. And then the plan is to have a quick update from uh, the team today, uh, not the search team because they haven't put it together yet, but the deacons will be counting today and then reaching out to the search committee, uh, the top five vote getters uh, this week. So, uh, but we're going to have a quick update during the membership meeting uh, for, for that. So uh, keep that in mind right after service. That will be very brief. And then um, also, I uh, just wanted to invite you uh, to, uh, on October 16th, we'll be having our Mid-Valley uh, Southern Baptist Association's annual meeting down in Fresno. Uh, something important is going to be happening there, uh, I think. Um, and, uh, and so we'd love to have you guys join us for that. And uh, there's going to be an ethnic food potluck, or ethnic food fair, however you want to say it. Uh, but we're Baptists, we understand potlucks better. Um, and uh, so, so this free dinner that night, Sunday night at 5 p.m. down at Trinity Southern Baptist Church in Fresno. So with the meeting following that. Uh, so I am the uh, representative of the Anglo churches and I'll be uh, uh, smoking cold pork. So at least you can come and get that. But I guarantee you there will be much better food uh, than, than my cold pork there. So... Um, and then also, we still have a number of these free copies. Uh, if you want a copy of this book, make sure to grab a copy and, uh, and take it with you, read it. And if you've read it, uh, begin to pass them out or take them to some of your friends and pass out uh, those books there. So, well, with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's turn our attention to God's Word. Psalm 66, uh, verse 1, and we'll begin reading on down through verse 7. To the choir master, a song, a psalm. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in His deeds towards the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in Him, who rules by His mind forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. You know, as I was reading this passage this morning, I was thinking how almost the complete opposite of verse 6 has happened this week, right? Uh, verse 6, it says, God turned the sea into dry land. Well, it's reference to Israel crossing the Red Sea, right? Uh, and then this week with the, just the devastating effects of the hurricane in Florida, um, so much that to, to be on our minds in regards to praying for them. So as we, uh, as we uh, are thinking about preparing our hearts for worship this morning, would you take a minute or two and let's pray. Uh, I know lots of damage has been done to a number of churches in Florida. Obviously, lots of people have lost their homes all throughout the state. Some are still without power or you know, electricity. Uh, so would you pray for them? Also, one of the unique things about being a part of the, the, the convention of churches that we are, we're going to have probably a, at least a couple hundred, if not thousands, of disaster relief workers who are going to be going into the state of Florida this, this week uh, with the Southern Baptist Disaster Relief Teams. And would you pray for the work that they're doing as well? Uh, they will have numerous opportunities to share the gospel and minister to those who are in need. So would you take a moment and please pray for the disaster relief teams and pray for the people in Florida who are being affected by uh, the hurricane. And then, then we'll come back together.
10 seconds and we'll come back to you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now. And Lord God, we pray for all those in Florida who have been affected by uh, the hurricane there. I pray that you would please... Uh, Lord, uh, help all of the teams that will be serving in various ways, whether it be disaster relief teams or just uh, construction teams that are going back in to rebuild homes and, and electrical grids. Uh, Lord, I pray for their safety in the midst of, of much of the damage that they'll be serving in. And Lord, we pray uh, specifically for uh, many of the Southern Baptist disaster relief teams that will be going in and ministering to people who are cleaning out their homes uh, that, that have been flooded that have been greatly damaged. Lord, I pray that you would help them to just be a great encouragement to all of those who are hurting. And Lord, we do ask and pray that they would have these numerous opportunities to share the gospel uh, so that people would come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I, I pray that they would be given just numerous opportunities to encourage those who are living in the midst of such awful destruction. Lord, as we come here, I pray that you would be honored and you would be glorified as we sing your glorious praises, as we remind ourselves of how awesome your deeds are and your great power. Lord, may all the earth truly worship you and sing praises to you, to your great name. We pray that you would be honored and glorified in this service today. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand and uh, join us in singing?
scripture for this morning for off to will be uh, Revelation chapter 7, going from verses 9 through verse, 10, verse 12, excuse me. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory, and wisdom, and thanks and honor, and power and strength, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Alternatively, it reads, Después de esto miré, y apareció una multitud tomada de todas las naciones, tribus, pueblos y lenguas. Era tan grande que nadie podría contar. Estaban de pie delante del trono y del cordero, vestidos de túnicas blancas y con ramas de palma en la mano. Gritaban en la gran voz, La salvación viene de nuestro Dios, que está sentado en el trono y del cordero. Todos los ángeles estaban de pie, alrededor del trono, de los ancianos y de los cuatro veres vivientes. Se postraron rostro en, en tierra delante del trono y adoraron a Dios diciendo, Amén, la alabanza, la gloria, la sabiduría, la acción de gracias, la honra, el poder y la fortaleza son de nuestro Dios por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. And I'll invite their brothers forward to present our gift and offerings as we continue after worship. Father God, we seek to honor you this morning in everything that we do. But from our worship, to our prayers, to the lifting of your word. And Lord, we long to be a people that reflects your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. A people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. From the uttermost parts of the earth, we gather this morning, not simply because of a historical document, but because of the living, written Word of God. You have given us Your Word, You have given us Your Son, who was slain upon a tree, and for our transgressions was crushed and bruised. And we thank You for such a marvelous sacrifice. And such that you gave for broken sinners, we come before you and we give to you. Knowing that you can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or imagine of the things that we offer back to you. We pray that you would take this offering, multiply it, and utilize it for the furthering of your kingdom and the advancement of your gospel. It's in your holy and precious name that we ask this.
me to 2 Timothy. Praise the Lord that His grace is greater than all of our sin. 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where we'll be. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse 1. And the plan is to read through the entire chapter 2. So uh, chapter 2 verse 1 is where we'll begin reading being reminded and being strengthened in the grace that God has given to us in His Word this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, God's Word reads, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is a hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we, were, if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are His. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, and love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, after being captured by him to do his will. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray. Holy Father, as we come before you now this morning, Lord, we thank you for your word that points us to the grace that you have shown us in Christ and points us to how we can be strengthened in the grace that you have given us through Jesus so that we can endure, so that we can persevere, and so that we can be faithful in the midst of this sin-cursed world. Lord God, I ask now that you would give us an understanding of your word, that you would fill us with your spirit to better live holy lives for you, lives that have been cleansed by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, so that we might be a faithful witness in this lost world. Holy Father, I ask now that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word, so that every heart might confess that Christ is Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. When you hear the word faithfulness, what, what comes to mind? When you hear that word faithfulness, what comes to mind? Or, or, or when you hear the word a faithful ministry, what might that look like? Remember as we're in 2 Timothy, these are Paul's last words. The last words he's going to write before he is likely martyred for being a follower of Jesus in Rome. And, and Paul is burdened 
by the burden with the ministry of the gospel, the good news of Christ crucified and Christ resurrected, the only message that saves, he's burdened with that ministry continuing on. And, and, and so uh, that is Paul's goal, that this ministry would continue. The ministry of being faithful to what God had called him to do and pass down to others to do. That was his goal, that it would continue on, that Timothy would continue this ministry. And you know, as we think about our own church, that's the goal of many of those who have served here, right? In times past, or many of those who are still serving here. But maybe who suffered for the sake of the gospel here at our church, or they sacrificed for the sake of the gospel in order for faithful ministry to continue here at First Baptist. And so, so much so, that, that is the goal of, of those who have served here in the past and serve here currently, that what Paul is saying here is clearly meant to be handed to us to continue on as well. What Paul is saying here is meant to be passed down to us and speaks directly to our situation here in this time of transition. Remember, Paul is encouraging Timothy to continue faithfully. He's continuing, he's calling him to continually faithfully, continue faithfully in the work that God has called him to do. And he speaks of, of how Timothy is to, to take this gospel, this good news, and entrust it and pass it on to the next generation. To pass on this gospel he had received from Paul to the next person behind him. He calls Timothy to remember the gospel, to remind others of the gospel, to flee from the passions of the flesh, and to call others to continue in the faithful work of the ministry together. And as we think about, again, the unique situation in which we are today, right? We are continuing this work that Paul passed down to Timothy and passed down through the centuries to others, to us today. This work is to continue on here at First Baptist. And as we think about specifically our own unique context in which we're beginning the process of calling another pastor, these areas that, that, that Paul is talking to Timothy they are so applicable to us today. These are areas that we must be aware of. We need to be aware of. Not simply these areas alone. I'm not saying that this is the only thing that, that we need to keep in mind as we call the next pastor. But we need to hear what Paul is saying to Timothy here. And, 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 and who has a desire to pass on the gospel. We need to be aware of these areas. And these are the areas that Paul is going to lay out for us in chapter 2. Okay? This desire to pass on the gospel. A desire to never forget the gospel. A desire to remind others of the gospel. And who also seek to flee the passions of the flesh. Because serving and pleasing Christ is far greater than serving and pleasing this world or the passions of the flesh. So as we consider the situation in which we are in, this time of transition and in the midst of the process of eventually calling in other pastors, these are the areas that we should keep in our minds, is what Paul is saying here. So as we come to chapter 2, we've come now to the body of this letter, where the first chapter, what we saw over the, a couple weeks, is the first chapter contained three imperatives, or we say three commands. Paul commanded Timothy to do three things specifically in chapter 1. Now, as we come to the body of this letter of 2 Timothy, he's actually going to lay out 30 imperatives, 30 commands. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, if you say, force behind what Paul is calling Timothy to do. It, we say there's a lot of actions that Paul is calling Timothy to. So the first 13 verses of chapter 2, what Paul is really seeking to do with Timothy is he's encouraging him. He's encouraging him to persevere in the ministry. And what we'll see is that Paul is going to use three different metaphors for the ministry. He's going to use this metaphor of a soldier, this picture of a soldier, a picture of an athlete, a picture of a farmer. And they all carry with it this idea of striving or, or of persevering in the midst of some sort of difficulty or hardship. And then in the second half of chapter 2, what he's going to turn back to is this theme of false teachers. To, to be guarding the church from false teachers who would come in and try to mislead and misteach 
the truths of the scripture. The truths of the scriptures. So Paul is going to do is he's going to contrast faithful ministry of pastors and elders, what that should look like compared to unfaithful ministry. Okay? And I understand many of you are like, wow, Pastor Greg's going to try and do a whole chapter in one day. Because he usually is just like five verses at a time. Yes, that is the plan. So buckle up and here we go. All right? So here is the first sort of thing that Paul is calling Timothy to do. He's calling him to entrust and pass on the truths of the gospel. We see that in verse 1. He, he calls him to be strengthened in the grace, by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. So that's the first sort of mark of a faithful ministry is what somebody uh, in a faithful ministry, that leader should have this desire to entrust and pass on the gospel, to pass on the good news. But, but real quick, go back to verse 1 and look at how Paul begins verse 1. You see, he says, You then, my child, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That you then, or maybe your translation has a therefore uh, right there in verse 1, that's connecting back again to what he was already, what he was saying in, in, in chapter 1. And connecting back right before this, what is he talking about? He's talking about those who have abandoned the faith. He's talking about those who have deserted him in the ministry. He is saying, look, you continue in the ministry, and you continue in the ministry not because of just those who are around you, but you continue in the ministry how? Verse 1, by being strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So what does a faithful ministry look like as you're seeking to pass down and trust others with the good news? It's by being strengthened. It starts with being strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I love the way Paul phrases that there. See that? Be strengthened by the grace that is in what? Yourself? That is in your own uh, grit, your own uh, uh, personality? No, no, no. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And first think about it. Paul, he had just finished speaking about how all who were in Asia had turned away from him. In other words, he's saying everybody has deserted him. Right? And he talks about uh, Phagellus and Hermogenes who had turned against him. And what Paul is reminding Timothy to do is that even when people abandon him, it's the grace of Christ that is going to allow him to be faithful, that is going to allow him to continue, to strengthen him to be persevering in the midst of great difficulties. Paul is calling Timothy to be a good soldier for Christ, in other words, to persevere, to be strong, and, and the supply of that strength does not come from some source inside of himself, but it comes from the divine grace of God, the, the grace that we just sang about, right? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Look, friends, if you live long enough in this life, there will be times where it feels like you're alone, right? Maybe you're in the midst of one of those times right now. Where it feels like you've been abandoned, whether it's in ministry or simply just in the Christian life in general. You have someone who was a close friend of yours and they turned their back on you. And then they never want to talk to you again. Or, 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 or maybe even worse, they, they, they try to destroy you. They, they like to gossip about you. Friends, know that if your faith is in Christ, that you are secure. Your identity is secure because of Christ's grace in your life. But He has shown us that through Christ giving of Himself for us on the cross and rising from the dead, that we can have hope in whatever situation we find ourselves in. So we would know God and we would love Him and enjoy Him for all eternity. So friends, know that the, the, the start of a faithful ministry or the continuing of a faithful ministry begins with you being strengthened in the grace that is found in Jesus Christ alone. So whether you feel alone because of someone who's, who stabbed you in the back or turned their backs on you and gossiped about you, friends, know that if your faith is in Christ, then He will strengthen you. He will give you the grace 
to endure. Our identities are secure, not because of ourselves or because of those around us. No, our identities are secure because of the grace that's found in Jesus Christ alone. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the umbrella that's encapsulating all that Paul is now going to command Timothy to do. You get that? So in light of, of all, in light of being strengthened in the grace that's found in Christ, in light of finding your identity in Him, He's now calling Him to these actions. And that first action, as I already mentioned, is He's calling Him to entrust or to pass on the gospel, to pass on the teachings about who Christ is and what He's done, to pass on the Word. So as we're strengthened by His grace, then what we're called to do is we're called to entrust and pass on the teachings of the Word of God to others. What we see here is that Timothy was to do what? He calls him to teach faithful men, implying these faithful leaders, these, the, the, these elders, these leaders, these pastors in the church, who would then do what? Teach others. And friends, this same command that Paul gave Timothy has been passed down to us today as well. What we see here is that faith, uh, Timothy is to teach and pass down. They're to teach and pass down. Teach and pass down all the way to us today. Why is it that the work of the ministry continues today? Why is it that, that, that we are to continue to make disciples of all nations? Why is it that that ministry continues with us today? Because of this command here. To entrust and pass down. In other words, to disciple. So that others may learn and know who Christ is. And trust in Him as their own Lord and Savior. And continue to pass on that good news of the gospel to the next generation. So this first command that, that He calls Him to is to entrust and pass on. And I want to ask you friends, who are you doing this with? Who are you discipling? Who are you training up in the faith and passing on the good news of the who Christ is, and what He has done. Yes, He's writing to Timothy, right? But this is to be passed on to us as well. So who are you discipling? Who are you training up in the ways of the Lord? And so with this strength that comes from God's grace, Paul calls Timothy to also share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. You see that verse 3? Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So rooted in the grace, rooted in the grace of God through the gospel, we are able to endure suffering. And part of that entrusting and passing on, that comes in the context of suffering. And what Paul's going to do over the next few verses, the next uh, three verses, is he's going to use these different metaphors for a faithful ministry. He's going to use this metaphor, this picture, this illustration of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer that all carry with it this idea of striving and perseverance. All three of these metaphors of the soldier, the athlete, the farmer, that they were all known for their strength, their discipline, and their endurance. So he says, no soldier, verse 4, gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. In other words, he's saying, look, don't get entangled in all of these different controversies. Please the one who has enlisted you. And believer, who do you serve? You see, do you serve this world? No, no, no. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So endure faithfully in his service. And then he uses this, the, the picture of the athlete. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And what happens if they compete according to the rules and they, 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 they finish that race? They receive the crown. The athlete's goal to get that crown that's set before them, pursuing that crown, they're focused on getting that to the end, finishing well, right? The idea of faithfulness and discipline. Then he uses the illustration of a farmer. You see that there in verse 6? It's a hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Whereas the soldier might be decorated for heroic service, the athlete receives a crown in public, the hardworking farmer actually gets to share in the fruit of his labors. His hard work will be rewarded. I love those three illustrations that he uses there, right? You have sort of two public, uh, two public um, 
honorings, right? You have the, the, the soldier who would be honored in public, the athlete being honored in public, the farmer likely not honored, right? In public. But his hard work will be rewarded. Showing us this picture of faithful endurance, right? So when we seek to pass on the gospel to the next generation, let's continue faithfully. And a lot of that faithfulness will be in the midst of great sacrifice, in the midst of sufferings. But let's endure because we're strengthened by the grace of Christ that is in us. So the first thing that he calls him to do is to, is to pass on, being strengthened in the grace of Christ. He's now to pass on and entrust others with this ministry together. But the second thing, now being strengthened in the grace of Christ that Timothy is to do himself is what? In verses 8 through 13, we see Paul call Timothy to remember. We can call it the ministry of remembrance. Paul exhorts Timothy to pass on and entrust us with the good news of the gospel. And here he tells Timothy what? He says, remember Jesus Christ. He's calling him, remember the gospel yourself. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The offspring of David as preached in my gospel, as we see in verse 8. How easy it can be for us at times to forget the gospel. Or, or even to think at times that we have moved on, right? We've moved on from this elementary teachings of the gospel. But what foolish thinking. But we dare not think that we have so far advanced beyond the teachings of the Christian life that we think the gospel is no longer necessary for our daily walk with Jesus. I, I, I've heard it been said by different pastors. I don't know who first said it, but it, they said it, it's easy for us to assume the gospel and then ultimately forget the gospel. And they tell an illustration of how one generation they know and they believe the gospel. The next generation just assumes that everybody knows and believes the gospel. And then what happens to the third generation? They forget the gospel. As followers of Jesus, we never move on from the good news of who Christ is and what He's done. We never move on from Christ's perfect life, His death on the cross for our sins, and His resurrection from the dead, showing that He has defeated sin and death. Friends, we must be clear on what the gospel is. And you want to know what the scary thing is? Is how many professing Christians are not clear on what the gospel is themselves. This last week I was talking to, to various groups of, of students about their testimonies and what they believe about the gospel. And this isn't at, at the seminary I teach. This is, this is just somewhere else that I was talking to some students. And the thing that really just broke my heart, well, there's a lot of encouragement. Some of it was, I was just... It was awesome hearing some students who, who clearly understood and knew the gospel. And that was a great encouragement to me. But the ones that stand out are the handful of other students who thought they were followers of Jesus. But their understanding of the gospel is, I'm just going to live a good life. And I'll be happy. And God will be happy with me. Friends, that's not the gospel. May that not be any of your understandings of the gospel here today. In order for us to, to, tra to, to, to pass on the gospel and to entrust others with the good news of the gospel, to remind the gospel, to remember the gospel ourselves, we have to know it for ourselves. You have to know Jesus for yourself. Maybe that's why the practice of personal evangelism, of sharing the gospel with others, has declined so much in our country today. Because there are professing Christians who do not even know what the gospel is, thus they cannot share it. Friends, do you know the gospel? Is the gospel simply just live a good life and God will be pleased with you? No, no, no. The good news of the gospel is what Paul is describing here. Look, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of Abraham. In other words, why did Christ rise from the dead? Because He died. And why did He die? For our sins. And how is it that He alone can die for our sins? Because He alone is sinless. He alone is perfect. He's the only one who can bear our burden upon, uh, for our sins upon the cross so that we might be saved. The good news is not that God just wants you to be, uh, live a happy and healthy life. 
No, the good news is that Jesus Christ has taken your place on the cross that you deserve, and He died on the cross and He rose from the dead so that you could have hope of eternal life. That's the good news of the gospel. So friend, do you know the gospel? Do you know Jesus Christ? So Paul calls him to remember Jesus Christ. And look, Timothy knew the gospel, right? I mean, he's mentored by the greatest evangelist and missionary the church has ever seen, right? He was mentored personally by the Apostle Paul. He had heard the, the gospel countless times from Paul himself. And you remember, uh, and actually, if you were to, to turn to, to the first letter that Paul wrote Timothy, he, he tells him of the gospel. 1 Timothy 1.15 The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he continually rehearses the gospel again in the second letter. Timothy knew the gospel. But why would Paul constantly call Timothy to remember Christ, to remember the gospel? Was it Timothy? Did he move on from it? Or did he not know the gospel? No, no, no. What Paul is doing, see, is showing Timothy and us today the danger of forgetting the gospel. And also showing that as believers, we need to remind ourselves of what Christ has done for us. Believer, remind yourself of the gospel. Uh, the, the great... Uh, Welsh preacher uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones talked about the importance of preaching the gospel to yourself daily. Remind yourself of what Christ has done for you so that you would be strengthened in the grace that He gives so that you can endure and face whatever this world throws at you. You know, friends, think about in, in Sunday school what we've been doing over the last couple months is we've been going through each book in the Old Testament, trying to do it, uh, in, in one setting, uh, the last couple of weeks we haven't kept a good record of doing that. Uh, but we're trying to give a broad overview of the books of the Bible, the books of the Old Testament. And, and what we've seen over and over and over again is what, is what does the nation of Israel do? What do the people of Israel do? They're constantly forgetting what God has done for them. And, and my own personal devotions, I'm in Exodus this week. And it, it's incredible. You read Exodus, you read how they're, they're brought across dry ground, and what happens like the next chapter? They begin complaining about food and water. The, the God of the universe allowed them to, 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 he opened up the sea so that they could go across. And there they are standing now on the other side, just a couple of days after that, if not the next day. And what are they doing? They're complaining how God doesn't provide them. They're forgetting who the God is that they serve. Yet how often we can do the same. Friends, do not forget who Christ is. Do not forget what He has done for you. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Do not forget that the Savior we serve has defeated sin and death, and He has ascended at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning over all. Despite what the world looks like, despite how it feels, whatever it feels like going on around us, Christ is ruling and He is reigning over all. Do not forget that. I also want to see real quickly, uh, Paul says, For which I am suffering, verse 9, bound with chains as a criminal, but the Word of God is not bound. Friends, that's a great reminder for us today, isn't it? The Word of God is not bound. Despite whatever suffering or hardship or persecution may fall upon the church, despite whatever dictator or oppressive government regime tries to do, may try to do to followers of Jesus, no earthly power will ever be able to keep God's word bound. Amen. What we've seen is that God preserves his word and the work of the gospel, and it will continue despite whatever circumstances may try to hinder its spread. Christians have been and will be imprisoned and shamed like Paul here. But what does he say? God's word is not bad. It will endure. I, I, I love the way uh, Martin Luther writes in, in the hymn, A mighty fortress is our God. He says, let good and kindreds go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth 
still. His kingdom is forever. Don't forget that. Remind yourselves of the fact that the word of God is not bound. So remind yourself of who Christ is. Remind yourself. Remember who Christ is. Remember that God's word is not bound. And remember that God has a plan of salvation as well as we see in verse 10. So remember Christ. Remember his word's not bound. Remember God has a plan of salvation in place in verse 10. Look what Paul says. He says, therefore, in light of the fact, remembering who Christ is, remembering that God's word is not bound, he says what? Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He says he endures for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain salvation in Christ. God has a plan in place for the salvation of his People. What we see here is the doctrine of election, and what this doctrine basically teaches, I'm going to try and summarize it in about 30 seconds, and there's a whole lot more to it than this, but this teaches that God has chosen some to be saved and others to not be, simply put. I, I've heard people say, the Bible doesn't, I, I don't believe in election. Well, the Bible clearly teaches the doctrine of election, it's just the debate is over what is actually meant by that, Okay? That's what people object to, is certain interpretations of this doctrine. But this doctrine does not ever mean that the work of missions and evangelism does not need to be done. Because what is Paul saying? He's saying, I'm suffering so that others may come to know Christ. It actually fuels that work, right? As, as Art read for us earlier in service from Revelation 7, 9, I asked him to read it in both English and Spanish because it's a great reminder for us that before the, the throne of God above in Revelation 7, that beautiful picture that we have is of what? People from every tribe and tongue and nation will stand before the throne of God and sing His praises together. Friends, He has, he has planned and He has purposed that. And that gives us fuel to continue faithfully in that work. That should give us great courage. That should give us great boldness to faithfully declare this good news here in Oakhurst and surrounding communities and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so remember. Remember Christ. Remember God's word is not found. Remember God has a plan of salvation for his people. And now he's going to move on. He's going to say, remind them and charge others. So verse 14, remind others of these things. Remind them of these things. Verse 14. Remind them of these things and charge them before God. Not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So Paul is calling Timothy not just to remember for yourself, but now to remind others of these things, of these gospel truths. Not only are we called to remember the gospel for ourselves and preach to ourselves, we're called to remind others of this as well. And over the, next of the, over the course of the next few verses here in, in 2 Timothy 2, uh, Paul is going to use a couple of images of faithfulness. We're going to see the image of the unashamed workman, the purified vessel, and the Lord's servant. So he starts off by saying the unashamed workman is to do what? To charge them, to charge others, not to quarrel about words, and calls them to avoid irreverent babble. Now what is Paul talking about it's just to avoid quarreling about words and irreverent battle. Does this mean that we should never get into theological arguments or seek to defend the faith? No, no, no. That's not what he's talking about here. The, the words, these words are doing what? He says they're only leading to ruining their hearers. The, the way that the quarreling about words could also be translated as word fights or word wars. You know, what might that look like today? Well, this would be someone who likes to leave behind the biblical words of God's revelation that Paul has been explaining and just talk about their own opinions. This looks like a teacher who does not focus on these things from verse 14. Those things are the biblical revelation of Christ and His Word, but who focuses only on arguments that ultimately lead to death and ruin. So what might this look like? 
This might look like somebody who claims to be a teacher of the Bible, but really does not teach the Bible at all. I'm sure you've heard from those who like to talk about how much they know the Bible, but then when it actually comes down to it, they never actually teach from the Bible. They never actually even open a Bible. Or, or maybe it looks like what uh, uh, we've seen over the last couple of weeks, even in our own state and other states, of those who like to take Scripture and twist it and try to make it, uh, make a point they want to make. Many of you have likely seen the billboards that our governor has put up in other states. Somebody told me about it at prayer meeting on Wednesday. I didn't believe them. Um, but our governor is posting these billboards in other states. They actually have a quote from Mark 12 about loving our neighbor. And it's talking about how uh, California wants to love our neighbors by having uh, free abortions, open abortions. That's a way in which somebody has twisted God's word, right? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, easy to spot. But how awful that is, right? May God have mercy upon us for us having leaders who would do such to God's word. So friends, I, I want to encourage you, as we, as we begin our search for the next pastor here, please commit to looking for a pastor who will feed you the Word. Not their own opinions, or some political talking points, or some commentary on the current state of politics, or who uses the Bible for their own special topics, but who seeks to teach and preach the Word of God in its proper context, and explains and applies it to your life. Someone who's like Ezra from Nehemiah 8, verse 8, which reads, They read from the book, the book of the law, they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. In other words, they read from God's word, they explained it so that people understood. May you look for a pastor who is one, like, like the one described here, as Paul's going to now uh, talk about a worker who's not ashamed, but who rightly handles the word of God in verse 15. Look what he says in verse 15. He says, Do your best to present yourself as a, as, uh, to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of God. The word used there for rightly handling carries with it this idea of, of cutting a straight path. Think of like building a, a straight path from one place to the next. Instead of swerving all over the place, goes from one place to the next. Which is clearly how so many people use the Bible today, right? They swerve all over, trying to twist whatever they, they want to say. You know, a good workman for the Lord cuts a straight path from the text of Scripture and what God has revealed to us, to us today. Straight path. And then he, he goes on, and we're going to move a little bit quicker. Verses 16 through 19, he, he calls in to avoid irreverent babble. What is this talk? What is this babble? It's unholy. It's ungodly. So I ask, I know he's talking about a workman, and, 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 but what about in your own life, friends? How is your speech to others? Is it unholy? Is it irreverent? Then hear Paul's warning here. He says, you're on the path to ungodliness, and that's only going to spread and infect like a disease. Okay, so he, he, he talks about this, this, this worker who's not ashamed, this unashamed workman. Now we're going to see a purified vessel in 20 and 21. The next portrait of faithfulness he uses is of a purified vessel. Look at me at verse 20. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Friends, that's what we all are, right? We're all vessels in God's hands to be used for the Lord's service in reaching this world for the gospel. So may we be purified vessels through the grace of Christ. May we be faithful vessels in our service for Him and how the Lord pleases. So how are you doing in being used as a vessel for God right now? And the final thing he calls Timothy to and calls faithful leaders to is to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. 
along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So in light of the impure uses that Paul spoke about in the previous verses that he's talking about right before this, he calls him to think, look, flee these youthful passions. Flee immorality, flee pornography, anything that would dishonor Christ. And instead of pursuing the passions of the flesh, be a faithful servant to the Lord and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, all from a pure heart in serving Christ. So the faithful servant flees from those passions that would ensnare them and, 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 and avoids foolish and ignorant controversies that leads to further quarreling. And so what does a faithful minister, a faithful follower of the Lord look like? Well, we see the Lord's servant now described in verses 24 through 26. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps uh, grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, being captured by him to do his will. So the Lord's servant, instead of being marked by impurity and controversy, is meant to be marked by a kindness, an ability to teach, endurance in the face of suffering, and correcting opponents with gentleness. Friends, these verses right here will help you make a good decision about calling your next pastor. Are they kind? Are they able to teach? Are they patiently enduring in the midst of evil? Are they able to correct opponents? And not just correct them in a, in a way in which to win an argument, but with gentleness. Isn't that interesting? Notice how Paul starts off. And he talks about kindness, right? And he talks about gentleness. Encapsulating both ends there. Now in our day, so many people see kindness and gentleness as weakness. But that's not the case. Our Savior Jesus Christ was perfectly kind, perfectly gentle, yet at the same time, He was strong and bold. So that false way of thinking, that you cannot be kind and gentle unless you are weak, is truly ungodly. Friends, the grace of Christ should strengthen us so much so, so that we are courageous and that we are bold, yes, but so at the same time we are also kind and gentle as we, see, as we see what Paul says here. Why? Why that way? So that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Anybody raise their hand if they've ever been convinced of an argument to somebody who was unkind and rude? Probably not too many of you, right? Friends, in our calling people to faith and repentance, calling them to turn from their sins, we must be bold and courageous. And at the same time, we can also be kind and gentle. Paul didn't see it as a contradiction. We shouldn't either. Wednesday night at, at prayer and Bible study, we talked about um, how it seems like so many professing Christians today uh, are, are, seem to just hate the lost people around them. That they would rather them just be punished Instead of coming to saving faith. Uh, I've often heard it said, you know, oftentimes we talk about Christians like the curse of darkness rather than calling them to the light. For instance, say you. Do you hate the loss all around you? Or is your heart broken for those who do not know Christ? Who haven't repented of their sins and come to know who Jesus is? may not be true of us here that we do not love the lost around us. May we as a church be known for our love of lost people around us and have our hearts broken by the fact that they have not come to faith and repentance and a knowledge of the truth. There is so much here that Paul is, is just laying out for what a faithful ministry looks like. What a faithful following of Jesus looks like. I know a lot of what I've talked about, uh, it, it, I've addressed specifically towards ministers, and pastors. But friends, all of this is applicable to all of our lives. So how is Christ calling you to be faithful to Him today? Friends, when you hear the word faithfulness, may you begin to see the picture that Paul is painting here for Timothy what it looks like to have a faithful and God-honoring ministry. Let's pray. 
Father, we come before you now. And Lord God, we thank you for your grace that strengthens us. Lord, we thank you for your, uh, your grace that cleanses us of all of our sins. So that we can be a faithful light and witness in this world. Lord, may we be known as a church that's bold, that doesn't compromise your word. A church that's courageous in our witness and calling people to faith in Christ. And Lord, may we also be known by our kindness and our love for the lost world around us. So that people might come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Repent, come to know the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Father, we pray for the next pastor of this church here at First Baptist, whoever they are. Lord, you know who he is. I pray that his ministry would be marked by these characteristics that Paul is laying out for Timothy here. That he would be faithful to your word, that he would be faithful to the gospel, and faithfully feed your flock here at First Baptist. I ask these things in Jesus' name. This time we're going to continue in worship. And uh, as we do so, let's be reminded that, that, that what this table represents is how we are how, how we are, are called to fellowship with the one true God. Friends, the God of the universe wants to have a relationship with us. And the way we do so is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus on the night was, when he was betrayed, uh, he was sitting with his disciples. I'm going to read from Luke 22. And uh, Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he says, he, it says, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Friends, what we're about to do here is be reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which we are all sinners. But this table is extended to all of those who have placed their faith in Christ, they've repented of their sins, they've trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior, and now we are seeking to follow Him faithfully. Our own statement of faith uh, puts it this way. I can find it. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church who partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate the second coming. So what we're about to do here, friends, is be reminded of what Christ did for us and how we're also looking forward to being with Him one day where we will sit with Him at His table in full fellowship with him. So friends, this table is extended to all of those who have repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus and have sought to follow Jesus faithfully through baptism. Friends, if that doesn't describe you, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, may you see this as an opportunity to do so today. Or maybe you haven't followed Jesus faithfully now through baptism, publicly recognizing your commitment to Jesus publicly. May you see this as His call to you to follow Him in that way today. So what we're about to do is I'm going to invite you to come forward and if you grab uh, one of these and take them back to your seat or grab them for the couple of people around you who may need some help, uh, come up here and, and grab them and make your way back to the seat as Beverly plays and then we'll come back together all together and, and take it. So, does anybody need one brought to them? No? Okay. You to come up in a somewhat orderly fashion.
are uh, able to, there's the two tabs there. So if you would uh, uh, please uh, take, take it and open it up, and then if you're able to, would you please stand? If not, you can say some of this way, but uh, would you stand? And what I'll do is I'll read, and then we'll take together. If all rights for I received from the Lord, would I also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he is betrayed to bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often, you, as, often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim the Lord's death. Would you continue standing as our music team goes forward?
have any questions about Christ, or if you have any needs for prayer, um, I'll be in the back, and uh, we'll love to speak to you further. Uh, don't forget, numbers, we're going to have a quick just update uh, meeting uh, right after service, so we'll try and start in about five minutes-ish. Um, but let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Holy Father, we come before you now, and God, we thank you that you are our one defense, our righteousness. And Lord, as we go from here, may we declare that boldly, and may we live courageously for you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Thank you.